Welcome again to church this morning. If you've joined us while we've been worshipping, it's been lo- it's lovely to see you this morning. Good to worship God together. Uh, as we said before, if you're, it's your first time with us, more uh, uh, a special welcome to you. And uh, we trust that you feel at home with us this morning. God will bless you in your time with us and we'll all enjoy his presence together. Uh, we've now replenished the welcome card stock. Hooray, okay. So they're out on the... Um, on the, in the desk in the foyer, if you would like to receive a weekly email from us and keep in touch with what's going on here, um, then please fill in the details on the back, just a name and a phone number, a mobile perhaps, and an email address in particular, and we'll make sure you go on our list for that. And if you pass that to me or one of the other leaders here, that would be great this morning. It's great to be able to come and worship, isn't it? Great to be able to come into the house of God. Great to be able to come into the presence of God. Uh, we know he's with us all week, wherever we go. But it's special when we come together. God says when we meet together in his name, he'll be with us. And so he's present with us this morning. So let's bow our heads. Let's be quiet for a moment. And let's contemplate that. God is with us. We're going to talk about a lot of that in a few weeks' time. We think about Christmas and things. God is with us this morning. So what would you want to tell him this morning as, you begin, as we begin our service, as we've worshipped him? And then I'll pray for us in a minute. So let's just be quiet before the Lord for a moment or two. And then I'll lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's good in the busyness of a week. We've already said, Lord, it's good to be able to come together and worship you and sing your praises. Sing these words of truth, Lord, that we've been singing this morning. Thinking about the day that's to come. We've been thinking a lot about that recently in our Sundays together. As we've been looking at the last book in the Bible. Tells the story, how we get towards that. Lord, we thank you for all of that, and we thank you, Lord, that we can experience some of that now, and we thank you for your presence with us today. We've just said, Lord, that you long to be with us, 
And we thank you, Lord, that you're here today with us as we've gathered, as you are with all your people throughout the world today. On this your day, as we gather together as church, the church in the world, Lord, but also this local church here. We thank you for your blessings to us. We thank you, Lord, for all your goodness to us in so many ways, even over these last seven days. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that the truths of your gospel don't change. But we thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, that you are seated on the throne um, and ruling and reigning in the heavenlies. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came from heaven to give yourself uh, unto death on the cross and raise again victorious in order that we might know the power of that resurrection in our lives. Those of us who know you and trust you and have, have placed our lives in your hands, we thank you, Lord, there's no safer place for them to be in the hands of the one who reigns in glory and the one who loves us and gave himself for us. And Lord, we thank you for that again this week. Thank you for these truths, Lord. We thank you that we can come together and sing them in relative freedom, Lord, and we don't have opposition in that sense, Lord, we can gather. We know, Lord, many of our brothers and sisters this morning will be gathered in fear, in, in, in a lot of trouble, Lord, as well. Maybe the, uh, the fear of uh, war and, and hunger and famine and persecution, maybe personal and corporate together as churches. Many of your servants will stand up this morning, Lord, and be in fear as they preach your word faithfully. But Lord, we pray that you be with them today. Strengthen them, Lord, as they seek to serve you wherever they are. But Lord, for us as well, help us to remember, Lord, the privilege we have to be able to proclaim your word, to be able to gather to pray and hear it and sing. And Lord, help us never to take that for granted. Help us to rejoice in that, Lord, and help us to, to uh, make the most of it in, in these days, that you, we may come with expectant hearts, ready to be equipped through your word, and encourage through worship and fellowship with one another so that we might go out and serve you in this world that badly needs to see the light of your gospel in people's lives. Lord, we pray for our, our fellowship here, Lord. We know there are many amongst us who aren't well at the moment, some in hospital. And Lord, we pray for those people at the moment. We pray for, um, for Marge, Lord, who's had a, a terrible time this week. And we just pray, Lord, for her that you would help those in hospital to help her lord with the pain and suffering that she's going through and we thank you lord that she has been able to get help and we pray father that it would be help that really works in the days to come lord we think of mark mckinnon in hospital as well been in for a few weeks now and still struggling lord still smiling but lord still um in these in the days of her life lord where things are unsure for the future as far as everyone else is concerned but we know lord our future and her future belongs with you and so, Lord, we pray that you'd wrap her up in your arms and let her know your comfort and all of the comfort that that brings at these days. Think of Sheila, Lord, this morning as well, who's been in and having scans and things like that. Lord, we pray that you'd be with her. Lord, you know the, the struggle that she's had with her health recently over many a year, Lord, and we just pray that you'd help her to get the help that she needs as well. And again, Lord, this morning, that she would know as we meet, we're praying for her, our dear sister. And for Liz, Lord, who's in hospital as well this morning, we ask, Lord, for her. We thank you that she's feeling better. But, Lord, we pray that you would, you would work a complete recovery in her through the treatment that she's getting and help her, Lord, to uh, be able to be home soon, back with her family again. And so, Lord, we bring, bring all these to you. But, Lord, there's lots of others as well, with colds, coughs, chest things, things that perhaps don't keep us into, take us into hospital, but we struggle, Lord. And we, life is a struggle. We've been talking about that. This is a, such an imperfect world. It, it's wonderful in many ways. But, Lord, the troubles and stresses and strains of this world and just living and getting older, Lord, they affect us all. So we pray, Lord, you'd strengthen us in our faith, strengthen us in our knowledge of you, that we might walk, even in the difficult days, with our heads held high and confident in the God who loves us and saves us. And so, Lord, we come up, pray for this service this morning and we pray for all the things that will happen. For the children who've come, Lord, for all that they will uh, hear and for the youngest right through to old, the oldest one here this morning, Lord, that we would all come. Whatever we need to hear, Lord, we thank you that your word is sufficient for us. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit this morning as we sit under the authority of your word. Let it judge our hearts and do its work amongst us this morning, that we might go out, as we said, strengthened to serve in the week that lies ahead. And we ask this all for your glory. And in Jesus' name, Amen.
Let's turn to God's word, shall we, together um, this morning. We're going to be back in the book of Revelation, as we've already said. And uh, this week's title is War in Heaven. Okay, that's what it comes down to. And uh, we've been looking, so it's our sixth session. We've got another um, three to go. So, um, and uh, then we'll be finished. So we're coming towards, we're sort of just through the middle, coming towards the end. We talked about uh, these uh, with the children before we looked at the video on the screen, how sometimes it's easier to communicate great big truths in pictures. And sometimes people are very good at doing that. And John, over, his, over the time we've been uh, following this, seen a big vision of Jesus in chapter one. That, that, that sort of grounded everything that we're going to hear in the fact that it's come from Christ himself, from heaven. And then we, we, we looked at chapters two and three with the letter that he wrote to the churches to tell them that well, I'm with you. I understand there are things that are not going well. You need to fix those and return and repent if you need to do that. But I'm with you. I'm holding you in the palm of my hand. Don't worry. Persevere. Keep going. That's the message all the way through. And then after that, we saw a great big vision of heaven and what was going on in heaven. God is sitting on his throne and Christ has triumphed. That's what we see as the Lamb of God. That's what we see in chapters 4 and 5. And then onwards from 6, we start getting these visions, these cycles of 7. We've already had 7 churches. We then had seven, um, the 7, scroll, seven um, seals on the scroll of God's will, as Christ is the only one who's, avail who's able to open the scroll and, re and not only reveal God's will, but also do God's will and make these things happen and bring it to pass. And so we saw seven seals, and all these sevens are cycles, which are not consecutive things. These are things that are going back and repeating the same thing time and again. So this is not a consecutive story. This is all of these sevens tell the story of what has happening behind the scenes and the reason why things are from Christ's resurrection to when he returns again in glory one day. Keeps telling the same story from a different angle. So we've seen, and ultimately it's a story of God's judgment on a, a world even today and using different things for God's judgment for the, the, the cruelty of man's sin and the way that people have re rebelled against him and the consequences of that and God uses that as judgment uh, on people but also we see in natural disasters we've seen things like that as well as the world there's something wrong with the world that it, it's not functioning the way it should it's uh, disintegrating and there's and so sometimes you see these natural disasters and things happen. And all of these are God's warnings and judgments to a world that says you need to turn back. You see what's going on, you need to turn back to the God who is seated on the throne. Because otherwise you'll get caught up in this judgment. And so all the time you see this offering of salvation. If you just repent and come back to God, then you will escape the, 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 the consequences of all this judgment and activity there and that's going on today and that's going on even now in the heavenlies as we speak but now this week we come to the third set cycle if you like of sevens and this week it's not so easy to spot them the seven signs they sometimes called but we've called it war in heaven because we, we've talked before in the church not long ago on sunday nights about spiritual there's a spiritual war that takes place think a war that's taking place in the heavenlies if you like a battle from people's souls for yours and for mine and uh, that, that, that uh, it's a battle that is won and God has won it. But t today we get a little bit of an inkling into what that battle looks like. Paul, if you remember, we looked when we looked at Ephesians and in chapter six talks about it in, uh, and, and, uh, as, as a soldier going into battle with armor and all the rest of it. And that's very relevant because this is kind of another way of looking at it with a fantastic vision of beasts and dragons and stuff like that. And that's what we're going to look at this morning here. The third cycle of signs from his resurrection to his return. This is what's happening now, this battle is going on. So we're going to look at this this morning. Um, and the background to this is this. If you read these chapters 12 to 14, you know, you see dragons and beasts and things like that. And the, the earth and the sea and all these different things. It gets you know, more as the weeks go on. And um, you think, what on earth is going on? And actually... It, you know, we've just looked at the Chronicles of Narnia. Some of you are really fans of Lord of the Rings or something like that. In their day, when this was written, the story of the dragon and the beast and the woman and everything else, all of that was a kind of a story that they knew. It was a cartoon story, a caricature story. It was, a, it was the way they told and they were using it. It's a story of good triumphing over evil in the end, uh, as they told the story. 
but the, 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 the characters and the, the things in the story, the signs, if you like, in the story, stood for different things. And as John's seeing this, so whilst it may be weird to us, it was very familiar to them, I guess is what I'm saying. It was like us looking and seeing, you know, Aslan as a lion dying and picturing kind of Christ dying on the cross. You know, it, it, it's pictures. So get it, that's kind of what's saying. And this is God saying, this is what's happening in heaven, in this spiritual war that's going on, but he's revealing it to John in something that he would know. Some, and, and in a way, it's just so big that it's actually better for us to understand it this way. Because it's not just something that's happened, oh yeah, fine, but this is something that really, it grabs your attention as you're reading it, doesn't it? Uh, some of you, so what you mustn't do, and I've said this all the way along, is interpret these things as literal things. Okay, because no wonder you would never sleep at night if you did that, dragons and beasts and things like that, and as it goes on, you wouldn't. These are literal, but these are, are, are giving us pictures of what God is doing now as he sits on the throne through Christ, his risen, exalted, victorious, triumphant saviour in the lives of ordinary people like you and me. Okay, so that's where we are this morning. So, and, and really, what we see today is this, this, well, the, the different signs show us different things. I wanted to give you some examples. I, I, was looking at, I was looking for how we could start this this morning, and, and, and I got this off somebody else. So this, these aren't my examples, but they really do picture it. Uh, we've seen the way um, good triumphs over evil in one sense, or evil is, is all-encompassing around the world. And when overreaching and overarching governments and politics and ideologies and idolatries take over and sweep the world with them. So, powerful Roman Empire in their day. The emperors see themselves as God. And the priests and the ideology and the cult of the emperor was practised. And if you didn't follow that cult, you were, you were in danger. That's why Christians were persecuted. Christians wouldn't comply. They would only worship Jesus and so were under threat. Fast forward a bit to the medieval church, the medieval days, Middle Ages, the Pope and all his powerful, uh, in all his power, incredible power, brought nations to their knees. But it was a corrupt religion and encouraged by the priests who were also corrupt in that days. Governments acceded to their ideology and forced it on people in that way. And so Christians who wanted to be biblical Christians like Sir Wycliffe and a guy called John Huss and those in those early churches, if you read about them, are martyred for preaching Christ by the church. Okay. Wycliffe in particular wasn't martyred by the church. He died, but the Pope was so angry with what he was doing in terms of getting the Bible into the hands of ordinary people that they dug up his bones and ground them to powder and burned them. How wicked and evil do you have to be? Move forward, 1930s Germany and Hitler's Nazi party. Political power and the German Christian movement that Hitler wanted to make, make all the churches comply to the gospel according to the Nazi party, to Hitler. And excluded Jewish Christians. They even wanted to abolish the Old Testament. Some of us might find that a bit easier to read, might they? I don't know. But they wanted to go all that way. And then you had people like Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Karl Barth, who, re who refused to comply and wrote a confession that was, they were called the Confessing Church. They would, wanted to confess Christ as the only way to salvation. They made this in the incredible courage against this huge regime that is within living memory for some people. And uh, this declaration they made included the words from John 14, 6, which we all know. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through me and they used that because there was a cult of the Fuhrer at the time that was being forced on the churches so we see this all the time and this is what and all the things that's going on behind that it's a spiritual war and you see it's working out in these great things and in our day we see some people doing something similar things ideologies idolatries overreaching governments forcing people to comply and against God and his people and wherever we see that, that's the story of what we're going to be seeing today in these chapters here. So that's the background to it all, if you like. We've always been in a spiritual battle. It's often seen in reality through these different things, paired, um, ideology paired with governments and politics. It's an, over, it's an overwhelming power. It seems unassailable. 
How are we ever going to get out of this? And sometimes false and uh, overcompromised churches help it along. We see that even in our day, don't we? And faithful Christians on the wrong side of history are suffering because of it. And still are today. So, let's look at these seven signs very briefly. We're going to read some verses from these chapters. We're not going to read the whole chapters, but read some verses from the chapters and see what, the, what this vision is. And then we'll try and make sense of it at the end, hopefully fairly briefly. The story of the spiritual battle behind the scenes. Remember where we've been. God is on the throne. Christ is triumphant. Seven seals and the trumpets tell us about God's judgment and all these things we've said. Warnings to a broken, sinful world. Right. Calling people to repentance and faith in God. And all the time, God's people, the church, although affected by the suffering sometimes, and have to deal with the consequence of that, and some of the songs we were singing this morning talked about that, didn't they? Yet they are safe and secure and saved and sealed for eternity. That's you and me, folks. If you're a Christian this morning, that's who you are. We may struggle in this world, but in the next We'll struggle. And the message all the way through is that one of patient endurance for the church. Keep going. Paul would say, stand firm. Don't give up. So the signs, first of all, in chapter 1, 12 and verses 1 to th uh, 2, we've got a, uh, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. This represents, this picture of this woman, representing the whole of God's people. Israel before, and the, the new Israel, if you like, the New Testament church as well. Old Testament people from whom comes the Messiah, and New Testament people who are pursued because they follow the Messiah. Okay? Second picture is a dragon, verses 3 and 4. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. It is pretty gruesome, isn't it? Let's face it. And the sign is, this sign is opposed to the woman. Extraordinarily powerful, seven crowns and all that picture. Seven crowned heads and horns which speak of power. He's identified in verse 9 further down. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient snake called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. So he's standing waiting for this child to be born from the church, the woman, the people of God. And of course we know who that child is. He's ready to power because he's his greatest threat. The child is a son in verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Who's that? That's Christ himself. It's Jesus. It's the Messiah. Born out of Israel. Born and uh, saved and got taken to heaven, God, uh, as I say, in his ascension. His identity is revealed in that verse there. It's an echo of Psalm 2, the promised Messiah. This is Jesus. More about these first three signs in a bit, because we'll come back to them. I just want to go through the seven first. So the next one is the beast. Okay, let's get into the beasts now. Chapter 13, verses 1 to 10, the beast from the sea. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. Now, when, I was, when people used to try and interpret these as things in our time, when the common market was, we first went into it, there was ten countries in the common market and everyone people i knew were jumping on to say that's who the beast is all right we've got to fear the common market we should never go in there because it's the beast that's not what this is talking about all right and anything like that we should avoid doing stuff like that really and i saw a beast coming out to see it had 10 horns seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns and on each uh, head a blasphemous name the beast i saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion the dragon gave the beast its power and, 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 and his throne and the great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but a fatal wound that had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. 
People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And although they worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority. Here's that number again. 42 months. Three and a half years. Remember that speaks for the time between Christ's resurrection and his return. That's what it's used for. We keep coming across that, don't we? It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and to dwelling place and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to con- conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Some creature isn't it really in this sense so remember it's a it's a kind of mythical creature in that sense but it's describing this overreaching authority of the world that we've been talking about the henchmen of henchmen of the dragon so it comes from the pit of satan himself if you like he will give the beast delegated power it's a picture of tyrannical political power opposed to god and his people and his purposes and in their day that was the roman empire so this is what it was describing, and that's why they used it in this way. They, it was so awful, and, and while we think it's kind of a million miles away from what we would think today, they would understand that. But wherever Christians are persecuted, unrelenting persecution, we see this kind of thing happening again. Opposed to God and his people and purposes, seemingly invincible. One of them was wounded, and a wound that could be healed. And again, in their day, that was referring to to Nero, who they thought had been killed or or given him. uh, And then he was supposed to. There was this um, kind of story about him being resurrected. And so, you know, it was so powerful that the Romans, it's a picture of that Roman sort of uh, empire. Kind of a good picture of what was with the, the, the corrupted church in the Middle Ages, Nazism and stuff in the 30s. And all the other isms and things that have persecuted and opposed God and his people throughout the ages. That's what the beast from the, from the sea is. Beast from the land, verses 11 to, 13, 11 to 18, has deception at its heart. See verse 11, 13 verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Okay, this one looks like a lamb and is cuddly and nice and somebody we can trust and somebody you know the lamb is a deliberate thing to it spoke like jesus would speak it said the things that jesus would say but it's a false prophet it's a false uh group of people false ideology false idolatry in that sense uh a false teaching spoke like that so that's what this is talking about it's also actually seen as a henchman of the dragon it comes from the pit of hell deceiving god's people False teaching and ideology. A compromised church and ideology. It's picture that fake uh, faith religion. And then we get this number that everybody knows about this beast. The number of the beast. Verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who is is insight calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of man that is 666. And if you've ever had anything to do with horror films and things. You see that coming up quite a lot don't you. This number of the beast. And people have tried to work out for years what this means, and there's some good attempts at it, you know, the whole idea of them numbering letters. And so the, in their day, they thought it meant Nero, the emperor. That's how, if you added up the numbers and the letters, that's what it said. It's a weird thing for us. But really, the simplicity of it is this. The perfect number that we've seen throughout Revelation and throughout John's writings and throughout their, in their culture was seven. The complete number, the perfect number. And uh, 666 is not 777, is it? It's the idea of man who are trying to be like God, behaving like God, but not being him. And that's what this beast is. And so that's what that number really means. Broken, fallen humanity, falling short of perfection, giving giving in to those who follow the zeitgeist or the thought of the day, what people think, the world's thinking. So it was the emperor cult. It was corrupt medieval priests. It was Hitler's counterfeit Christianity. Seems very plausible, giving into that. A false prophet, that's what this beast means, okay? And so there's this unholy trinity, if you like, opposing the Messiah in this story, in the spiritual war that's going on. 
the dragon and the two beasts. A significant, powerful opponent. But all the time, and this is why this is happening, it's happening now, if you like, that the church has been opposed, God has been opposed, Christ has been opposed. We have the next sign in chapter 14 and verses 1 to 5. The Lamb standing on Mount Zion. Who's the Lamb of God? Takes away the sin of the world. It's Jesus. Then I look, says John, and there before me was a lamb. This is not at the end of time. This is now. It's a picture of us worshipping, as we've been doing this morning. Standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Remember, we've covered that before. 144,000 is the complete number of those who have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved in the future. In heaven. And we're all standing together for all time before the Father's throne. Safe before the Father's throne. And I heard a sound from heaven, like a roar of rushing waters and a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except those 144,000 who'd been redeemed from the earth. And these are those who didn't defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They were, they were purchased from amongst mankind and offered as firstfruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouth. They were blameless. These are Christian, you and I, us. This is us. We stand before the throne. We stand before the Lamb. We've been saved and redeemed by the Lamb. We've been made pure by the Lamb. Not that we aren't pure, not that we are pure intrinsically, but we've been made pure before the Lamb of God. The church. Blameless before the Lamb. They follow the Lamb. This is the church in the world today, in the past, and in the future. And we have cho- those are people who have chosen not to worship the beast. And to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Is that you this morning? To follow Jesus. They're glorious and they're saved. So that's six signs. And then there's an interlude in the next few verses. We'll come back to that in a minute. But then we go down to verse 14 to verse 20 in the end. But we're just going to read a few of these verses. And we see a white cloud and the Son of Man at the end of chapter 14. I looked and there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man. Is this, again, familiar terms, aren't they? And uh, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And the other angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. And this again is the picture of all these signs. There's all this beast raging. The God's people are safe. There's all this opposition to him. And at some point in the future when God decides there will be a judgment and the harvest from the earth will be reaped. Now often a harvest is seen as a good thing. Okay. We'll come back to that in a second. But this was a picture of one like the son of man. That is a picture of, again if we know our Old Testament. That comes from Daniel uh, in the Old Testament. It's a picture of Christ. It's a picture of the risen Christ. Who's doing the harvesting. And acting God's will. Bringing in those who are saved. And go, uh, are um, belong to Jesus. And he's given glory and dominion and a kingdom. The nations and tribes and tongues will serve him. All of them one day will have to, whether they like it or not. And the ancient of, he's called the Ancient of Days. He's the one who executes, executes all the judgments of God. He opened the seals and it's Jesus. Here he's reaping the harvest of the earth. It's where we get the, you know, sometimes you see this picture in our day of the grim reaper. Any picture of that sometimes? This is the sort of verses that lead people to think of it like that. But in one sense, he's for for, for those who are Christians, he's anything but grim. He's reaping a harvest of those that belong to him, and we are taken and celebrated over. But it is pretty grim for those who aren't following Jesus and have been taken in by the cult of this world. The harvest has two edges, of course, in Old Testament imagery. A grain harvest is seen as good. So this first harvest we just read about is the good harvest. It's the harvest of people like you and me, if you're Christians this morning, following Jesus, belong to him, saved and and sealed by him. Then that's the harvest he's talking about there. But there's also bad fruit they have to take out. And in this it goes on to describe that as grapes that are brought into the wine press and trampled down. And it's, it's kind of a very graphic picture which I'll go into, but you can read it for yourselves. 
And it pictures again God's just and final judgment. Justice is done. Judgment is terrible. We've seen that, haven't we? And all that, but this justice has to be done. On, it's on all of that injustice and terrible pain inflicted by the dragon and the beasts in people's lives. It mustn't be overlooked, but will be dealt with. So how do we make sense of all of this then? What a picture. What an amazing, that's what it all kind of stands for, if you like. For this is tw chapter 12 to 14. It's a picture, as we say, of the spiritual warfare that's going on in heaven. And behind everything wicked, that's what's behind what you see in the world. This is what's going on behind everything wicked and evil that we see around us. Whether it is through governments or people or individuals or whatever. Satan is at the heart of all of it. That's what we believe as Christians. It's not just random. And there's a war that's going on. Sometimes we see it in, in action on the earth. But it's always going on in heaven. And though Satan is defeated. He fights for every single soul. He contends for them. So although he's a defeated foe. This is what he does. He looks powerful. Like those empires and governments and things. And invincible. Unstoppable. But what these visions are meant to tell us and tell the church in John's day and tell the church in our day and tell Christians who are struggling and wondering what on earth's going on in the world and why are we, yeah, what, what, what's God doing? What it tells us is that there will be an end to this when God says, and Christ will be triumphant. And it's like it, it, this, this number we keep coming to, three and a half years, 1,260 days, 42 months, and sometimes it's called a time and times a half time, mysterious things. But these are kind of, this was, the, as I say, the time between Christ's resurrection and his return. That's what it stands for here. And it's somebody who once called it, and a fellow called Richard Buse, I read this week, calls it the number of Elijah. Do you remember Elijah's story? And when Elijah came, God sent Elijah to bring judgment on Israel's enemies, King Ahaz. And he goes and tells him, and he says, go and tell him it's not going to rain. It's going to be, there's not going to be any rain for three and a half years. It's not going to rain, and it won't rain again till I say. It turns out to be three and a half years, funny enough. Accident? I don't think so. And in between that time, Elijah and all the people of Israel were affected by that famine and lack of rain and drought. The judgment was affecting them too. But all the time, God, if you read the story of Elijah, kept them, provided for them, helped them. And then there was an end. When God told Elijah to go and tell him there's going to be an end. And it's a picture of our time here on earth. A picture of the things that are going on these days. That it's not literally three and a half years. We're talking about the time between Christ's resurrection and when he comes. God is with us. He will provide for us. But there will be some damage to us in the sense of physically in this earth. That we will struggle with everybody else. Because we've all the things we've seen over the last few weeks. The effect of this beast, these beasts and the, the dragon and all the warfare that's going on in heaven. It's real. It's not unreal. You just see it around the world. Where does all this evil come from? If you don't think it comes from there, if people, are, well, where does it come from then? Where else is it coming from? You've only got to open your paper every day. Look at the news. Read everything. Hear the conversations that take place online. It's vile. It's corrupt. It's horrible. And you see Christians on the wrong side of it all, all the time. And we worry, don't we? We think, Lord, what are we going to do about the... You know, the legal, assisted legal dying sort of bill. What are we going to do about abortion? What are we going to do about these other things? These great problems, of, these big things of our age that we struggle with. And these are signs of what's going on in the heavenly. So if you didn't ever believe it, just look around you. You can see it. And the Bible explains it here. It might seem a bit wild and a bit out there, but for them it wasn't. And for us it shouldn't be. Because if you're not experiencing it, then you're not living in the real world. And as a Christian, if you don't feel under pressure and on the wrong side and tempted to compromise with this worldly thinking, then you're not being real either. Because it would be an awful lot easier if we did. And that's the nature of this beast, isn't it? Trying to deceive people like you and me, the church of God, to compromise. And we see it happening even in our own day. And that's what's going on. It's the story of Elijah again. But God's keeping us. He's kept him and he kept, keeps us as well. And so the message to Elijah, the message through Paul to the Ephesians in their very real day was stand firm. You have the armour of God. I'm not going to go into all that this morning because you need to go back and look at the video for that. But we have, haven't we? We've got the armour of God. God has provided for us. 
Receive all the nourishment that you can from him. The battle is in the heavenlies. It belongs to the Lord, but it will affect us here on the earth. So who are you trusting in? Don't be tempted to compromise. And so we see back in chapter 12, if you could just think back there, the woman and the dragon and, and all of that sort of thing. The story is there. The Messiah is born. He's taken back to heaven. Michael, it says, and then it goes on to read. We didn't read this bit, but this is where it talks about that the veil of heaven is drawn back. And Michael, this archangel, is, is, is talked about as going, and angels defeat Satan soundly in the battle in heaven. And he's cast down to earth. And he has not, and he cannot win. Because he'll always lose. But in his fury, we see in the story goes on, he pursues the woman. He pers the dragon pursues the woman. Satan is pursuing God's church. He's pursuing you and me. And he wants us. And he's, sin is crouching at the door. The Bible tells us in different ways all the way through. This is what's going on. That's why you will have trouble. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart. What does he say? I've overcome the world. This is this. That's what we're reading here. In the fury, he pursues the woman. For a significant time, three and a half years, 1,260 days, three and a half, oh yeah, the, the, whatever it is, months, 42 months. And he, but it's, it's in God's time, God is sitting on his throne, so he's in charge of when it is, and when it happens, and when it starts, and when it stops. Right? In the meantime, Paul tells us, put on your armour of God, stand firm with the King, Jesus. The battle belongs to him. Satan and his henchmen seem unstoppable. And he can cause real hurt and heartache. But he can't win. Whatever the world looks like in this particular time. Whatever's oppressing the world and oppressing the church. He can't win. When we look at that out and we look at what's going on in our world today. What you need to remember. This is the work of a defeated enemy. And we don't need to fear now, there's no promise of escaping the suffering, as I've said, and it will be there, but we are safe and sealed, singing the song of the redeemed before God. But while this is all ongoing, there's encouragement from heaven. Again, look back at chapter 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in, in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, here's the answer to this, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heavens and earth and the sea and the springs of water. Christian, that's what we do. In the face of all of this, that's what we do. Take your eyes off that and worship God. Fear God and give him glory. Non-Christian, person who doesn't know the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and you think, well, I'm not sure about all of this. But that's what the Bible is telling you. The story of the gospel is you need to take your eyes off yourself and the world and the deceptions of this. And you need to fear God and you need to give him glory because the hour of his judgment is coming. Mercy and grace is being offered through the eternal gospel, even in these here. Then a second angel in verse 8 followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, who made the nations, who, which made the nations drink with, of the maddening wile of her adulteries. Babylon, we'll see this more next week, is actually seen as kind of this is the world opposed to God and the world doing its own thing. And so he says it's fallen. It's always been hard to follow Jesus in every age and in every time. It's never not been. It is today. But imagine this. No one could ever have imagined the fall of Rome. It's too big, too indestructible. God wins. No one could ever imagine the end of papal power and corruption through the priesthood and everything else in the Middle Ages. God wins. No one could ever have imagined the fall of Hitler and the Nazis. God wins. And so we see that happening here as well. And all the other ideologies, all the other things that will rise up and oppose God will be defeated. They can not win. And that's the message from today, isn't it? They seem so powerful and destructible, but no one can withstand the judgment of God. No one. And then the third message is the message of that terrible judgment. In verses 9 to 13, the third angel followed them with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, which is pictorial again, it's not a literal thing, but if they start, if they're sealed with them and they're given themselves over to all of this, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, who has been powerful, 
sorry, <laughs> who has been, which has been poured full strength in the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulphur in the presence of his holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast or its image, and for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This is difficult stuff, isn't it? This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God, of you, this morning, who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And then I heard the voice from heaven write, write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Those who struggle through life, those who have been opposed, martyrs, not just them, but all of us who faced opposition for the name of Christ. Better, uh, blessed are those who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labour and their deeds will follow them. Glorious promise for those who belong to him. Don't be fooled. That's the message. Don't get caught up in the judgment that's coming. It's an encouragement for us to all endure to the end. So fear God and give him glory. Be careful to those who want to stand against him. Those who want to take his glory. Those who want to oppose him and his people. Be careful of them. And you be careful or you'll get caught up in God's judgment of them. So as we finish this morning. What's behind all of this? The disorder and dysfunction and disintegration of the world. It's a spiritual battle. Do we believe it this morning? Do you think it's all a fantasy or a fairy tale? There's a spiritual battle. It's cosmic. It's been going on since eternity began. It's been going on since, and, and in the way it is now, since Christ rose from the dead. And it will go on until he returns. But it's already been won. That's the good news, isn't it? Don't be fooled by the world that looks so impressive. Their arguments... And the criticisms. Don't be taken in by their ideologies. Or idolatries. Don't be tempted to compromise. That's what this is telling you as Christians. Don't, and Christian, don't be afraid. And stand firm. In the armour of God. Hold on. Keep going. With patient endurance. The, uh, these enemies, they can't win. Well, I just want to finish this morning with a psalm that sums all this up. And it would have been much easier if I had just talked about this. Psalm 23, you all know it. This is the story of your life as a Christian and the story of mine and the story of what's going on in the spiritual warfare. And we all know it, don't we? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores and refreshes my soul. He will guide me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, death's dark veil, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me, in the presence of all that oppose me and you, and you are my enemies, and you will anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows and finally surely your goodness and mercy and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever it's your story and it's mine that's why this psalm is so precious and it means it, that it tells the story of what we've been talking about this morning it all might be going on it might be difficult to understand it might be insurmountable issues and all of the world may be against us and everything might be going against you know, us as Christians in church and everything else. But this is our story. The Lord is our shepherd. And we will, and he will lead us home. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We thank you for the encouragement. We thank you, Lord, for um, giving us eyes to see some of these things, Lord. We pray for those may be confused or, or whatever uh, this morning, Lord, through the things that we've mentioned. Lord, give us clarity through your Holy Spirit. Help us to see which side we're on. Help us to understand when things aren't going the way that we want them to, Lord, that there's a much bigger picture here and you're sitting on the throne and your son is exalted and has been victorious. This is a battle that the world and everyone else won't win. There is judgment coming, Lord, and whilst... You know, we're not gleeful about that, Lord, in one sense, because we, you know, it's a terrible thing. But, Lord, for us, we thank you that we stand before your throne safe, singing the song of the redeemed, 
worshipping you for eternity. Whatever happens, Lord, we are safe in your arms because you are our shepherd and you will lead us home. And so, Lord, we thank you for all these wonderful things that we're learning to, in these days. Lord, let them be an encouragement to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.